welcome to today's presentation on fruit. Facts and spoilers, a botanical approach. Yes, today we are talking about fruit, but we're not going to talk about how to prepare fruit or how important fruit is in our diet. Those are dietary interests. We're here for the botany of fruit. And just look at the background that we have here, very seasonal chock full of fruit, not fruit that you might associate with um, a full plate or a five a day. The acorn, a fruit. The holly berries, definitely fruit. And the berries of the mistletoe, fruit. We're talking about the botany here. Pine cones, not fruit. Why not? We're going to find out. I hope that's what you joined us for, because that's how we're going to proceed. My name is James Stevenson, and I'm with the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences here in Pinellas County, Florida, coming to you from Brooker Creek Preserve. Now, although we are a part of the Food and Agricultural Institution, um, my bit is natural resource conservation. And as good stewards of our natural resources in our little overly developed county, our urban county, um, it is our job here at Brooker Creek to um, draw a line between our citizens and the natural world. And we do that by appealing to people's interests. And people have a lot of interest in plants. So we have found, so we have taken advantage of. And so we bring information about the plants around us, giving people a broader understanding of plants, more than just growing them in your yard, but just the amazing things that plants do for us, around us, and right under our noses that we never even notice. So broadening your mind, joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate your attention and we'll crash on. If you have any questions or comments or complaints, you're welcome to use the question and answer tab. You should have a little control bar somewhere on your screen uh, or the chat. Uh, Julia and I will be monitoring both and getting to your questions and comments as we can. Might have to save them to the end, but we'll do our very best to answer your questions throughout. Okay, let's get started. Fruit, we've all heard the word. And we know that fruit has a nutritional or a dietary application. It is a food group, the fruit. And when you mention fruit, you know, to someone, an image of an apple is most likely going to appear in their head or, you know, an orange or a watermelon, something that's very everyday, something that we're all very familiar with. But the word fruit is shared by the nutritionists and by the botanists. And as a botanist, I'm going to argue that we had it first, that it's a scientific term that has specific application and a very precise definition. And we're going to look at these things today so that you can win a bet uh, expand your brain, uh, and again, gain a greater understanding and appreciation for the world around us. So fruit as a nutritional, its nutritional applications are certainly not unfamiliar to us. The fruit, the fruit group, right? Oranges, avocado, yep. Uh, limes, a fruit, grapes, of course, pineapple, kind of a weird fruit. Uh, strawberries with the seeds on the outside. What's that all about? You get it. Fruit is a word that belongs to the botanists and it refers to an organ, just like we have organs, brain, heart, lungs, etc. Plants have organs. One of those organs happens to be called the ovary. Sound familiar? Flowering plants have 
ovaries. Keep that in your mind. Now there's 400,000 that we know of flowering plants. And each one of those different kinds of flowering plants, what we see here, the parrot lily, or the Gerber daisy, or what else is in this? The bells of Ireland, these little cut flowers, even those, those are flowering plants. And each one of those flowers has an ovary. Okay, keep that in mind. The flowering plants having that ovary produce fruit. So all 400,000 different flowering plants that exist in the world, they all have an ovary, so they all produce fruit. The ovary becomes the fruit. And here that is happening. This is a photograph of a squash fruit maturing. And what's happening is that swelling underneath the flower is the ovary until fertilization, pollination takes place and then the ovary begins to develop into a fruit. This is a squash fruit. It could be, it could be anything. It's kind of hard to tell right now. A yellow squash, a pumpkin, uh, some kind of gourd. It's one of those, it's in that group. Not clearly um, differentiated yet enough for us to know. So of the 400,000 different flowering plants found worldwide, only about 2,000 of those, 400,000, produce a fruit that humans consider a food, okay? So of 400,000 different flowering plants, each of which produces fruit, only 2,000 are considered and used edibly, nutritionally by humans, only, only 2,000. So that's just a tiny little fraction. Now, us Westerners, and I mean us in the you know majority of things, I certainly hope that some of our listeners and viewers here today uh, might have a broader experience than just the typical Western diet. Lucky for you if you do. The Western diet, only about 200 fruit, different kinds of fruit are a part of our uh, depauperate fruit um, menu, as it were. So that is an extremely tiny bit. We in the West only eat about 0.05% of all the available fruit in the world. Now, is that a shame? Should we be eating more fruit? Of course, we should all have more fruit in our diet. But not all the flowering plants that produce fruit produce a fruit that we might even want to eat. Let's explore. Why not eat all the fruit? Well, there's a particular fruit that's known as the sand spur or the sand burr. And it is the ripened ovary of a species of grass. And that fruit is not juicy and sweet. It's dry and it's armored. It's covered in spines. So even though it is, botanically speaking, a ripened ovary, it is a fruit. It does contain a seed. And there is some provision of getting that seed away from the parent plant. It is a fruit, but it's not one that we would necessarily want to eat. Not that it's going to kill us. It's just not something that humans would con hitherto consider bringing into cultivation for food. Other fruit, ripened ovaries, might be perfectly useful for people, but not to eat. The ripened fruit of the cotton plant, the ripened ovary, the mature ovary, of the cotton plant that contains the seeds erupts into the cotton bowl. Now that's not something that humans have considered, again, yet, as a food source, yet we have still found it very useful. 
It's a ripened ovary. It contains the fruit lufa. Help yourself if you want to try and eat this one. Certainly is useful, has its applications, but humans have found different ways of interacting with this ripened ovary. The lufa sponge is a type of gourd. If you remember a couple of photographs back, we had the ripening gourd. It could very well have been a lufa ripening. And we don't eat this one. We have other applications of those very strong fibers that this particular ripened ovary possesses. That's why we only eat a couple, because even though these plants are producing fruit, they're not all yummy fruit. That's what I'm trying to get to today. We're changing our minds, we're expanding our brains, we're considering fruit as a concept beyond our plates, because some stuff is pretty fascinating. And that's the botanical bit. And that's the journey we're going to head down now. So as I have implied, if not expressly stated so far, the botanical definition of fruit, which applies both to the nutrition side, but um, writ large across all of the flowering plants, the fruit is the ripened ovary of a flowering plant, sometimes including associated tissues that are nearby to or associated with that ovary. The fruit contains the seeds. The flowering plants have this adaptation of enclosing their seeds in a nice, safe, secure, um, uh, supportive structure, the ripened ovary, protecting the seeds as they ripen and providing some sort of dispersal mechanism to get those seeds far away from the parent plant. The dispersal mechanism could very well be being sweet and juicy therefore making the fruit attractive to be consumed with the seeds being swallowed intact and deposited, shall we say, a time later by whatever animal has consumed that fruit. That's not the only dispersal mechanism. In the center drawing here, we have the winged fruit of the maple tree. And that fruit is not a fruit that is inviting a bird or a squirrel or a raccoon or possum or human to consume. This plant is protecting its seed inside of a fruit, but it has adapted the fruit into a helicopter shape so that the main purpose of that safe enclosing tissue is dispersal to send the offspring far away from the or far enough away from the parent plant so that competition for resources is not an issue and as we mentioned very first off the acorn is the fruit of the oak tree it is a ripened ovary with a single seed inside it's not a fleshy fruit it's not a sweet fruit but it is taken by animals as a food source, some of those animals might bury the acorn fruit. And then if they forget that it's there or if something untimely happens to that creature that has buried, that fruit, the seed within, then has the opportunity to grow into a new tree. So that's, that's where we're going today. If you've sat any of these lectures before, you may have seen this slide. It's really easy to understand plants if you just take it little bits at a time. And if you can learn to count to four, you can realize that plants, land plants that surround us every day, the common land plants that are a part of all of our lives, whether we notice them or not, fall into four categories, just four, we have the little uh, easily overlooked mosses that just do their thing, 
kind of out of the way, out of sight, out of mind. The second group is the ferns that reproduce by spores. They have their own life cycles and stories and life histories and all that. The third group is the conifers. They make cones, they put pollen in the air. Again, not very many of them, They're, they've been outcompeted and certainly outnumbered by the largest group of plants on earth, the flowering plants. They are the most populous. Remember, 400,000 different kinds of flowering plants and all of those flowering plants and only the flowering plants produce fruit. Let's show you an example of a plant that, a flowering plant that might be familiar to all of us, hopefully. Or if you've not ever seen one of these before, perhaps you've heard of a tulip. These are tulip flowers. Clearly, obviously, a flowering plant. Not a moss, not a fern, not a conifer. These are clear, straightforward flowering plants. So let's zoom in and have a look at what the flower is doing. The point of the flower is the reproduction of the plant. And if now we're, now we're pollinators, you and I, and we're seeing this lovely presentation before us, and we know in our little insect minds that if we fly towards this color, this shape, this configuration, Perhaps even there's an ultraviolet signature somewhere hidden within this flower. If we go towards these colors and patterns, we're going to get a reward in the form of nectar. So we have a reason to go down in there. So let's go in. What we find are these kind of upright structures covered in dust, easily um, kind of avoided maybe or not really necessary to interact with. There's this tri-cornered structure here, but what we want is down here at the bottom. We want to get to the nectar that's down here. So we're going to clamber over all of this mess because, you know, it's just kind of in the way and we are going to head for that nectar reward. In so doing, we, the pollinators, are going to transfer what we picked up from another flower, the pollen that we picked up from a different flower, we're going to transfer it onto this spongy surface that's purpose-built to lift pollen off of our pollinator bodies. Attached to this tricolored spongy structure is the special organ, the ovary. This is the ovary of the tulip flower. Remember, 400,000 different flowering plants. Tulips, here's what their ovary looks like. If we successfully transfer the pollen onto that tri-cornered tri sponge, the pollen does its thing, it finds the ovary, it gets inside the ovary, fertilizes those little egg cells that are inside the ovary, and a fruit develops. So here is the fruit of a tulip. Not something you think about eating. It's not something you can buy at the produce stand. But being a flowering plant, the tulip produces a fruit. And here is the fruit of the tulip. It's a dry fruit. And when it's ripe, it cracks open. And the seeds inside can just shake onto the ground. And if good luck and chance are all in line, at least one seed will grow to maturity to reproduce that uh, bloodline, as it were, of tulips, okay? That's how the fruit is formed in a very familiar plant, an unfamiliar fruit of a very familiar plant. Across or a longitudinal section through a typical or a cartoon flower shows you the different flower parts. We all know the big petals that surround a lot of different flowers. And inside, just inside the petals are the anthers, the stamens that produce the pollen. 
And in the very, very center lies that ovary with the eggs inside. And some sort of mechanism where pollen can be transferred to that same organ so that the pollen has access to that ovary and the eggs inside. Here's a different flower with the petals peeled away, but the parts are the same. From flower to flower to flower, 400,000 different times, this is how each flower is put together. That ovary that sits in the center of the flower, the most important part, it stays attached to the plant throughout the ripening process with the little seeds developing inside. And then as the fruit ripens, whatever dispersal mechanism is also imparted. One of our favorite little wildflowers up here at Brooker Creek. This is a spider plant relative called a roseling. It's not a rose, but it's pinkish rose colored. Roseling, small, very uh, ephemeral. It only each flower only lasts a day. These delicate little petals they literally melt, but they do their job. They attract a pollinator to bring the pollen from a separate plant and deposit it on, on that little white dot by accident. Pollinators are just messengers. They don't know what they're doing. They're just bringing stuff unwittingly. They're trying to get the nectar reward. And in so doing, they're doing the plant's bidding. The same parts of this roseling are shared with the sun rose, another one of our wildflowers. It clearly isn't related. They're different flowering plants. They're obviously not the same species. They come from very different ends of the flowering plant spectrum, but the parts are exactly the same. The petals are attracting a pollinator. The anthers are creating a gauntlet for the pollinator to traverse on their way to the nectar reward. And the ovary sits in the very center of the flower with the spongy surface accepting pollen off of the pollen vector to fertilize its seeds. Even the sunflower group, a very large group of flowering plants, by the way, very effective, very streamlined, very efficient in putting a whole lot of tiny little flowers each one of these little star shapes, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. Each one of these is an individual flower crowded into this disc that looks like a giant flower. It's actually a bunch of little tiny flowers. And each one of these flowers is complete with all the parts that are shared with all the other flowering plants. Each one has, each of these flowers in this photograph, one, two, three, four, five, six that are open for business. Each one of those has an ovary. So each one of those is going to make an individual fruit. So all of these flowers together, this inflorescence of the Florida green eyes wildflower, each one of these is going to make a fruit, an individual fruit. Oak trees a major component of our urban canopy in our urban county of Pinellas, oak trees. If you would hearken back to those big four, oak trees are not a type of moss. Oak trees are not a type of fern. Oak trees are not a type of conifer. They don't produce cones. And the only thing left they could possibly be is a flowering plant. We just don't think of them as flowering plants, but they are. And their flowers are made of the same parts. And here is a female oak flower. The oak has taken the flower and broken it into its components, its male components and its female components. It keeps them on the same plant, but just separates them in space and in time. So that when the male flowers are ripe, they release pollen into the air and then they fall off fall on the ground. We get our cars are covered in these oak, male oak flowers in the springtime. The female flowers on the other side, other on the other hand, and on another branch, 
sit quietly with their big puffy lips sticking out into the wind, hoping to grab some of that oak pollen out of the air. They don't have showy petals. They're not attracting insects. They're not producing nectar. It's too expensive. They just sit and wait with their little fat ovaries and their little puckered lips waiting to grab pollen out of the air. They, the oaks, have this non-insect vectored pollination syndrome. And they don't pollinate themselves, again, because they separate themselves in space and in time. The males are, male flowers are produced on one part of the plant. The females are produced on a different part of the plant. The males are produced earlier. They're gone, they're on the ground when the female little puckered lip flowers are ready to grab pollen so they don't grab their own pollen. The result is the fruit of the oak tree, a single seeded ripened ovary, the acorn. So flowers, let's sum up, flowers have ovaries. Ovaries contain eggs. Eggs become seeds and ovaries in turn become the fruit. And the fruit that we're talking about today protects the developing seed. It nourishes the developing seed and it inevitably provides some sort of mechanism to get the seeds away from the parent plant. See how smart y'all are? You got that. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about the banana? It is a fruit. It's the ripened ovary of a flowering plant. Where are the seeds? What's going on here then? How does, how does that work? Well, it takes us back to this whole dichotomy of the nutritionists versus the botanist, or let's work alongside the nutritionists, shall we? In order to make a palatable fruit that humans are more likely to ingest and enjoy and reap the benefits of, we have tinkered with the genetics of wild plants and forced them, the wild plants, into sizes and shapes and colors and flavors and textures and quantities that are not found in nature. It's what we've done to dogs. Nothing wrong with what we've done to dogs, but we took a wolf and we made it into a chihuahua. Could a chihuahua ex uh, survive in the wild? Absolutely not. It can survive and it can bring us enjoyment because of what we've done to it, but it depends on us. The banana represents one of these genetic tinkerings, the culmination of years of genetic tinkering until a plant appeared that was so mutated that it produced an incredibly nutrient dense, sugar rich, but seedless fruit. We messed with the genes so much that the plant forgot how to make seeds. It just forgot. It just, it can't, it just, it can't. And we took that plant that couldn't make seeds because it had a really giant, sweet, sugar dense, nutrient rich fruit, and it will make the fruit. We took that and we cloned it millions upon millions upon millions of millions of times. So we have this domesticated fruit that can't survive in the wild, can't reproduce itself, but we can get in there and do that all for it. So yes, it's a fruit. It's still considered a fruit, yes. But it comes from, this banana comes from a wild relative that acts more like a fruit. It produces a ripened ovary. 
it produces a ton of seeds embedded in a sugar rich nutrient dense matrix that is inviting to be eaten by primates, large mammals. The wild banana pictured here is what humans took and tinkered with until we got to the clone that we're all used to eating today. Got it? Let's look at another example of a familiar plant with a likely unfamiliar life cycle, the peanut. The peanut flower looks like, if you've ever grown sweet peas um, or any kind of legume, this is a typical legume flower. It has this large advertising petal that's called the banner. It has two little petals that are clapped together on either side called the wings. And up underneath, there's a petal that's called the keel. And this floral, these, these, this petal configuration of this one of 400,000 flowering plants, this petal configuration is attractive to the bees, the wasps, the flying ants, whatever that exist where this plant evolved. Here we have a little wild bee that knows exactly how to open the door to get inside the peanut flower to get the nectar reward. And in some cases, the bees have figured plants out along the way as well. Not only can they get a nectar reward, but they can steal some of that, some of that pollen because pollen in and of itself is pretty nutrient dense. So here we have a bee that's doing both. It's drinking nectar and it's also collecting a little bit of pollen. But in its efforts, it is also transferring some pollen from one flower to the other. What happens next for all the flowering plants, but in our peanut in particular, in this example anyway, the pollen grain actually germinates kind of like a seed it itself. Um, the pollen grain germinates and grows this long tube. Remember that pollen is deposited at the tip of that spongy structure. And then that pollen tube is going to grow down towards the eggs that are inside the ovary. So that's what these pollen tubes are doing. They're growing in search of eggs. And they have hormones that lead them along the way. Once the ovules are discovered deep within the flower, the pollen tube transfers a sperm cell into an egg cell. It's all happening within the ovary of the plant. This enhanced photograph, photomicrograph, actually shows in yellow those pollen tubes that have been deposited at the tip of the structure that is called the stigma, and they have grown down towards the ovary, and you can see them all terminating in what would be an individual ovule. So each pollen grain is in search of a single ovule that's going to fertilize, an embryo is going to be formed, a seed will ensue, the ovary will release the seeds into the world. So once the pollen tube has found an ovule, it's chickaboom time, fertilizer, fertilizer, fertilization happens, birds and bees, the whole thing, and an embryo is developed. The seed inside the ovary contains this embryo. And all of that is safe and sound inside the ovary, the peanut. So we had the peanut flower, we had peanut ovules. Once the peanut ovules were fertilized by peanut pollen, we got these seeds developing inside the ovary. What does the ovary of a peanut look like when it is ripe? What does the fruit of the peanut look like? What is the ripened ovary of the peanut? So yes, it's edible. Yes, it's a fruit. No, it's not 
our immediate vision of a fruit, but technically it is the ripened ovary. How to get underground? That's the magic of the peanut. The flowers are produced above ground. Obviously, that's where the bees are going to find it. And then once the bees been there, the plant shoves its formerly above ground ovaries underground, safe and protected even more from predators or grazing. So an added layer of protection is shoving the ovary underground so it can ripen underground. The benefit of that is that when the seeds are ripe and the fruit dissolves a little bit, the seeds are already planted in the ground. So not only are they protected, but they're ready to go the next year. Another potentially familiar word when we're discussing flowering plants and their reproductive strategies, there's actually a tissue called the placenta where the seed is connected to the ovary and that feeds the developing embryo because the little embryo is the next plant. You can even see its little, its little first leaves as a little crown here and its first little bit of root poking down. It's ready. It is ready. It's got everything in place. The seed also contains all of this reserve carbohydrate, all this reserve starch that is meant for the embryo until it gets on its roots and can push some green leaves into the sunlight and start making its own sugar. That's the story of all the flowering plants. Whether they're familiar to you or not, this is the process that is happening. We're using familiar things like legumes, in this case, the peanut or a, or a bean. You can see the placenta here feeding the embryo and all this associated starch. The majority of a seed is that starch that is meant to feed the embryo. In the peanut, in our little peanut legume, the fruit is referred to as a legume. The fruit is also referred to as a nut. A nut is a technical term. A legume is a technical term. We might be familiar with both. This is a dry fruit with a very oily seed inside. I hope this is cool to you. That's it. That's the tada. That's a flower, flowering plant going through its life cycle and producing a fruit. They're all doing this out there. And remember, everything you see out, well, 98% of what you see out your window is a flowering plant. So they're all going through the same process. Different flowers, different resulting fruit, but the process and all of the associated organs are the same. Are y'all okay? I hope everyone's okay out there. I'm gonna stop, check for questions. Y'all are either stunned, asleep, or engaged. I don't know which, but we'll carry on. So in the case of the peanut and now that we have expanded our brains beyond fruit having to be sweet and juicy and sugary and for sale, um, let's look at the different types of fruit. Fruit can be dry, like a nut. Remember this nut with a hard, dry shell and a very oily, dense, carbohydrate-rich, single seed or sometimes a few more seeds inside. That's a typically technically, botanically speaking, a nut. A walnut is an example of one of these with a hard shell and a single rich, nutrient dense, oily, embryo feeding set of cotyledons inside that ripened ovary, which has become a shell. The peanut, legume we talked about before. Here's a dry legume and legumes 
as a group, the, the beans, the legumes, when they're dry, they split open. We tend to eat unripened. It's kind of infanticide when we eat green beans because we're eating an unripened baby and the unripened ovarian tissue um, more as a vegetable. If we were to leave green beans on the plant and if they were allowed to go through their natural progress, the legume would split open. It would be a dry fruit that splits open. Here we have a ripe legume. And if beans are being grown for their dried seeds, legumes, beans for a 15 bean soup, they are allowed to dry on the plant so that their seeds can be extracted. There's a fruit that's called a capsule. Not an unfamiliar word, but it's applied to botany this way. This is the sweet gum tree. And this makes a, a spherical cluster of chambers, each chamber containing an individual seed. And when everything is ripe, when all, when, when all is said and done, the ovary has done her job of feeding the seed and enriching all that tissue that's going to support the developing embryo, the ovaries open, all those little ovaries open and release the seeds with their attendant starch for germination. Another capsule, if anyone has ever grown flowers in a more temperate region, uh, north of, you know, the panhandle northward, you might have grown poppies. Poppy capsules are sometimes sold to stick into dried arrangements or just as an interesting thing. I don't know. Anyway, they are a capsule. That is a fruit. When it's ripe, it is dry and it has several openings around the top of the ovary where the ripened seeds can just shake out like a salt shaker. We mentioned earlier about the whirly gigs, the helicopters, the spinning seeds of the maple tree. Here's a dry fruit. It's actually papery when it's ripe. It doesn't produce a lot of juicy flesh. Its dispersal mechanism is to fly. And so the provision is made by the ovary to give their seeds wings. Grasses are flowering plants. Do the exercise. Grass, is it a moss? No. Well, if you didn't realize, I'm telling you, grass is not a moss. Mosses can only get to be less than an inch tall. So if you've got something that's bigger than an inch, it's not a moss. Anyway, so grass, it's not a moss. Grasses are not ferns. That might be an easy enough concept to accept. Grasses are not conifers. They do not bear cones. So that only leaves us with flowering plants. And yes, grasses are flowering plants. The seeds of the grasses have a special name, and that special name is grain. And grain is a word that is used botanically. That's a single, each one of these grains or kernels of corn, grains of rice, are an individual ripened ovary with a single seed inside. Did you know that? Each kernel of corn is a single ripened ovary. Each kernel of corn is an individual fruit. The cob is not the fruit. Each grain, each kernel is an individual fruit made up of all of the little ovaries that are scattered along the cob itself. Corn silk is that conduit between the reception of the pollen the growth of the pollen tube down through the silk until it finds an individual ovary, transfers the sperm, finds that little egg inside the ovary, and an individual corn kernel is produced, the fruit. 
another grain or caryopsis. If you really want to get fancy and show off, you don't need to. Um, anyway, another grass fruit. Here we have a former set of flowers. You can even see what's left of the little pollen producing structures still kind of tucked in here. Their job is done. They're just withering and falling off, but the ovaries are now swelling and ripening with that seed inside. And those ovaries are armored. They're armored for protection because they don't want to be chewed up and swallowed. They don't want to be chewed up and ground up because that would destroy the seed. So these things are armored. And they also, that armature also affords these seeds a, um, a, a one-way trip away from the parent plant by grabbing on to anything that happens by and having that thing that happens by eventually groom these sticky seeds off, you know, just to get rid of them, hopefully far away from the parent plant. Now we've already talked about what's happening with the sunflowers, but let's just go over that one more time. This whole group of flowering plants that are related to each other called the sunflowers or the asters. Aster being star, the star flowers, the aster group. They're all related to each other and you'll see just how related they are once you take the time to peer into the heart of an artichoke or a sunflower. Here we are looking at, artichoke is also a type of sunflower. Anyway, here we are staring at the inside of a sunflower. This is not a flower. It's a sunflower, yes, but it is not a single flower. As I mentioned before, this group produces hundreds of very small, very efficiently packed in a special spiral that is just right for packing in the highest number of individuals into a circular area. Hundreds of individual flowers. Each one of these flowers that is crowded onto this disc have all the bits and pieces that belong to the flowering plants, including the pollen covered anthers, the sticky stigma that grabs pollen off of the pollinator, petals. You can just peer and see these tubular, these yellow tubular flowers with a little, little crown of pointy petals at the very top. So it's a tube with a star-shaped opening at the top of the tube. Pollinators come and stick their tongue down into that tube, trying to get to the nectar that's found at the bottom. And in so doing, they transfer the pollen. And all we all know what happens next. After the pollen is transferred onto this sticky stigma surface, it grows down until it finds the seed inside this ovary. So here we have a cross section of a sunflower disc. And you can see each one of these flowers sitting on the disc, each one of these ovaries of each one of these flowers sitting on the disc, each one of them containing a single seed lined up, very efficient, um, really, really, really packed in there. So when we eat this sunflower seed remember that you have to crack through this outer suitcase that's the ovary that's the ovary wall the seed is actually inside so each one of these zebra striped Tasty little morsels is an individual dry fruit that belongs to the single ovary of a single flower crowded densely into a loaded flat disc 
of the sunflower. So just a reminder, fruit can be dry when it's ripe. This type of fruit has a name, botanically speaking, that you've probably never heard of and you probably won't remember, but it has a name, this dry fruit called an akeen. It's a good crossword. Is it a wordle, akeen? Is it five letters? I digress. Another familiar akeen, no, it's six. Another familiar akeen is a dried fruit that belongs to another member of the sunflower group, bidens, or beggar's ticks, or hitchhikers, or Spanish needles, all these common names for the same thing, bidens, two teeth, dense, by two, dense teeth, two teeth. And you can see the two teeth sticking off the top of these dried akeens, the dispersal mechanism for bidens, two teeth, are to hook their teeth into the passerby and transfer the hitchhiker onto the passing creature. Another familiar akeen belongs to another member of the sunflower group, the dandelion. So the dandelion fluff, these are flying ovaries. Each one of these, what we would call seeds with parachutes, the seed is actually inside that weighted bottom part. That's the ovary. The seed is retained inside this ovary. The parachute carries it far away from the mother plant. And when it lands, hopefully someplace satisfactory, uh, the little seed will burst through the ovary wall and become a new dandelion. Examples of dry fruit. And an akeen is a type of dry fruit. We looked at capsules. We looked at legumes, we looked at akeens, uh, different types of dried fruits and caryopsis or grains as dried fruits. Some dry fruit actually split open to release the seeds. The grain doesn't split open, it stays like it is. The akeen doesn't split open, it stays like it is. But some Fruits, when they're dry, they split open and let their seeds out. And some of these might be familiar to you if you grow uh, milkweed or any of its relatives like oleander. If you've ever seen an oleander pod open up, it has these fluffy seeds inside. So this is ovarian tissue that makes the pod. And it's a dry fruit. It's a dry ovary at maturity. So it splits open as a follicle to release the seeds. And instead of each ovary having a parachute, like the dandelion, in this case, each seed inside the ovary has a parachute and the ovary has to open to release those seeds into the environment. Our friend, the okra. If we were to leave the okra on the plant and let it go through its full life cycle before eating the immature ovary and the immature seeds inside, if we were to leave it alone, it would become, it would develop into, it would ripen into another type of dry fruit or another version of the follicle where we have these longitudinal splits that allow the ripe seeds to shake out on the ground. Do you remember what this one is called? I just said it, it was a spoiler alert. It's a legume, it's a dried fruit that splits open when it's mature, when left to mature naturally. If you don't know this legume, you probably should. This is called the rosary pea. Uh, it is a legume, but it's certainly a legume that you do not want to eat. This is a deadly, poisonous legume. It is also an invasive, exotic, non-native, ecosystem disrupting plant. It was probably brought to Florida on purpose because it's pretty cool. I mean, these seeds are pretty cool looking, um, despite the fact that they are sinister. Uh, it escaped cultivation and it is now 
a resident baddie. So the strawberry, here we go. I, I can tell y'all are still cooking. Your brains are still working. So we're gonna talk about the strawberry here. The sunflower seed is a dried ovary with a single seed inside. And do you remember the name of that one? You can read it right here. It's Nakeen. The strawberry is a dried fruit that does not open to release the seed. On the outside of the strawberry are these little embedded fruit. Each one of these structures, crunchy as they may be, are ripened ovaries with a single seed inside each one. A single strawberry flower in the sacred center has its lady parts separated into hundreds of individual ovaries. So in most cases, an ovary sits in the center of a flower and it might be made of many parts, but the strawberry represents um, a kind of an exploded diagram where instead of having all the bits fused into a single multiple ovary, they're all hanging out by themselves. And each one of those ovaries ripens into a fruit called a nikine, embedded in the outside of a bit of special stem tissue. The red of the strawberry, the sweet, juicy, irresistible part that we love to eat is stem tissue. It is associated with all of these independent ovaries. It's all these ovaries are sitting on this specialized stem. They get fertilized, pollinated, all the good stuff happens. And then the stem that has been holding the flower modifies itself into this sugary, attractive, brightly colored dispersal mechanism that is inviting something to swallow, eat and swallow with these little dry fruits with a single seed inside staying intact throughout the digestive system. What? It's true. That's how it happens. Here's a, cross, a longitudinal section through a strawberry flower. There's that stem. There's that stem that's going to swell and all these little ovaries independent of one another, which is kind of unusual for flowers, but it's not unheard of. All the little individual ovaries sitting on top of this stem. Each one of them is going to grow into an individual akin. Of course, being surrounded by the stamens that have the pollen and the petals and so on. It's just the configuration of that particular type of flowering plant. So this receptacle, this is stem tissue, and all of these little individual akines are technically, botanically speaking, individual fruit. They're all derived from an individual ovary. It's referred to as an accessory fruit, if you really need to know. Because the fruit are the akines embedded in the fleshy, sweet stem tissue. Together, this whole structure is referred to as an accessory fruit. What about the fig? Another crazy story. Do we have time for this? I'll try and hurry up a little bit. If you grow a fig tree, or if you were to grow a fig tree, if you've ever grown a fig tree, you might have noticed that the fruit just appears. 
you don't get a flower that's followed by a fruit. You just have this like fruit show up and start to ripen. What's happening with the fig is this structure, the fig, is produced on a branch and this stem tissue supports a hundred little flowers enclosed in a brown bag. This brown bag emerges on the side of the plant with a single opening right there. Inside the bag are all these flowers. They never see the light of day. They never see the light of day. Along comes a wasp. Who knows what the fig means? And the wasp knows that it can go inside this brown bag and it can find a place to lay its eggs where it will be safe. And there's all this sugar being produced and it's safe from predators and you know it's secreted away. So the wasp goes in this opening, she lays her eggs and leaves. But when she leaves, she's covered in pollen. She didn't know that part, didn't mean to. But then she goes into another bag and she transfers that pollen. And this is happening all over the place. So all the figs are getting pollinated. All these flowers inside are getting pollinated without ever seeing the light of day. So each one of the flowers inside the bag has an ovary. So the fruit develops inside the bag. All of this is happening, again, out of the light of day. We could go on about what happens to the wasps when they hatch, and if you eat a fig newton, are the crunchy bits wasp eggs, but we won't. It's another type of accessory fruit, the fig, the special case. It's also a multiple fruit, uh, because these are individual flowers, so each one of these flowers has an individual ovary. It's why the strawberry isn't a multiple fruit, because it's just one flower that produces the strawberry, even though it's stem tissue with a bunch of ovaries. These are all individual flowers. Multiple fruit. Fancy name, Psychonium, if you must know. So again, we have the stem tissue that kind of acts as the dispersal mechanism, the um, attractive bit that is going to encourage a large mammal or a large bird um, to consume the fruit to get the nutritional value from all that sugar. And these little hard seeds inside, they can survive, hopefully they will survive the trip through the digestive system to plant fig trees far from the parent plant. So those, now let's look at a fleshy fruit, a truly fleshy fruit, an ovary that when the ovary is ripe, it's not dry. It's not dry like an akeen. It's not dry like the fruit that comes out of a follicle. It's not dry like a grain, it's fleshy that we're more familiar with. A multiple fruit belongs to this bromeliad here with all of these little purple flowers arranged in a spiral staircase inflorescence at the top of a well-armored plant. This berry, a berry is a thin-skinned multiple seeded fleshy fruit. Tomato fits that definition just perfectly. Nobody said anything about being sweet or suitable for a smoothie in the definition of berry.
thin-skinned, multiple-seated berry. Mm -hmm. A banana is a berry. Here we have a wild, another wild banana berry with this thin skin. And there's multiple seeds hanging out in there in that wild. This is the velvet, velvet banana, velutina, a species of banana from Central America. The citrus is a fleshy fruit, truly a single ovary in your hand, navel orange. Again, genetically manipulated by us to forego the production of seeds, to continue ripening the ovary and all these placental hairs full of sweet and acidic juice with a oily rind. This Hesperidium or citrus fruit. Fun, fun fruit name, the Peepo. Technical, botanical, use it in your everyday vocabulary. There's another Peepo. The gourds are Peepo. Um, pumpkins, I don't, you know, pumpkins, gourds, squash, cucumbers are related. Basically, a cucumber is uh, an unripened squash that um, has a very thin skin like a berry, but has much more of a um, rind flesh, whereas the berry is mostly juice. Here's a collection of peepos. You've probably got some of these rotting on your front porch right now, don't you? A droop is a single seeded fleshy fruit. Classic example, the avocado. And along the same lines of humans domesticating the banana and creating a, an unnatural, can't survive in the wild, can't reproduce itself, genetically tinkered with fruit. The avocado has kind of domesticated us. Um, the fruit's on the other foot. Um, there is no living animal other than humans that can keep avocados around on earth. The avocado evolved alongside some large mammals like ground sloths that would greatly benefit from swallowing avocados whole and passing those seeds right through the digestive system unbothered. But now the ground sloths are gone and there's nothing that big that could swallow these things whole and crap them out later on to keep avocados on earth. But around the time the ground sloths were disappearing, the humans were finding that these were quite delicious as well. So thanks to us, avocados have not gone extinct. Otherwise there would be nothing that would be performing the job of the distribution mechanism for the avocado. Oh yeah, I was like, what is that? That is the red bay droop, an avocado relative. So our native red bay makes a droop just like its cousin, the avocado. And here I can make the point. Well, there's a fleshy droop that's related to avocado that's a native plant and it's fleshy and it's a droop and it's native and can I eat it? Maybe um, here at the preserve, we leave everything where it is for the animals because they've got it hard enough as it is on, in an urban county. On the other side of that, because humans have been around Red Bay for as long as humans have been around Red Bay, thousands and thousands of years, it has never really behooved humans to bother with the cultivation of this plant to the point where we've gotten something that is 
nutritionally dense enough to make the effort worth it? You see where I'm going? We've done that with the avocado. We kept that one around. We've got that one in cultivation. The blueberry is a native North American plant that we've taken into cultivation and manipulated to the point where we have a predictable, uh, large, rewarding crop. Uh, you know, bananas were taken out of the wild and cultivated. So you, you might be able to eat the red bay fruit, but I guess human history has shown us that you don't need to. You really could just leave it for the animals. We've, we've domesticated plenty else. Another droop, the stone fruit, a single seeded fleshy fruit. I just said stone fruit. I, I preempted myself there. Um, a native stone fruit, the Chickasaw plum or a wild plum. Our native blackberries. This is a fun one. It's an aggregate fruit. So again, we have a single flower and all of its little ovaries aren't connected to one another. They don't speak to each other like estranged sisters living inside the same flower. So all these little individual ovaries, they don't have anything to do with each other. They ripen themselves into individual little droplets. So each one of these ripened ovaries has a single seed inside. So a fleshy fruit with a single seed being a droop on this tiny scale, a droplet. I just think that's a great word. I'm about to lose my voice, so let's sum up. I think it's a good place to, to end up this afternoon. I hammer this over and over and over again. My point is really to give anyone who bothers to listen the confidence to realize that you already know an awful lot about plants because you can break them into four easily considered groups, the mosses, the ferns, the conifers, and everything else, which would be the flowering plants. Fruit belongs only to the flowering plants. Only flowering plants produce fruit and all flowering plants produce fruit. Be careful when you say all or never or none in biology because you're going to find that exception. But for today, flowering plants make fruit. It's their reproductive strategy. Conifers make cones. That's their reproductive strategy. Ferns make spores. That's their reproductive strategy. The fruit protects the developing seeds. The fruit is a ripened ovary. Ovary, ovaries contain eggs. Eggs become seeds. The word for flowering plants is angiosperm. That translates to protected seeds. The conifers don't protect their seeds. The cones, they just throw seeds, they just, Seeds, scale, gone, no protection. Flowering plants, they protect their little ovaries. They protect their seeds as their, they don't protect their, the ovary protects the seeds. The O is the ovary across all the flowering plants. You've seen this. Surely at some point in your life, you've tried to grow a tomato or knew someone who, you've been around perhaps a developing, so you've seen this, you've seen the yellow flower. And the next thing you know, the yellow is gone. Did the petals turn green? No, they're just part of the flower bud that has stuck around. The petals are gone. They dried up and blew away. But the ovary persists and feeds the developing fertilized ovules, now known as embryo inside a seed. So the ovary is feeding these until they are ripe and then providing a dispersal mechanism in the form of a fleshy fruit or a dry fruit that opens up and lets the wind be the dispersal mechanism or an armored fruit that's going to grab onto your socks or your fur. The ovary is going to provide some sort of dispersal mechanism. The coconut is a fruit. The coconut is a fruit. The coconut is a fruit and the dispersal mechanism for coconut is 
Let's see if anybody's still with us. Anybody want to put in the chat or in the, yeah, put in the chat what you think the dispersal mechanism for the coconut is. I'm going to take a drink of water while y'all try and find your chat. We're going to need you to type something soon anyway, so you might as well access your, access your keyboard. Well done. It floats. Robert says it's, it, you know, storms. Yes, a little bit of both. So the coconut, the dispersal mechanism is water. We don't even know where coconuts originated because they have floated all around on the sea. They've just been circulating their entire natural history. So this ovary is buoyant and the food that the ovary provides the developing seed is liquid. Coconut milk, coconut water, it's all a rage. While the seed is on the water, that liquid food, that liquid endosperm is sloshing around as it floats up. Do you like what I'm doing? I'm being a coconut floating on the water. As soon as the coconut stops sloshing around, that's the signal that it has found land. When the sloshing stops, the seed is triggered to germinate. It wouldn't do much good if you germinated at sea in a storm. So once the sloshing of that coconut water stops, the seed then begins to germinate. So here we have a mother plant that is providing a dispersal mechanism for its offspring in the form of a buoyant seafaring seed fruit. The seed inside with this liquid endosperm that signals when it's time to germinate. So we're all going to be eating a lot of fruit, fruit cake. The fruit cake's going to have candied fleshy fruit, also nuts, which are fruit. We don't eat the shell. Of, we don't eat the ovary wall of a nut, or I don't. I hope you don't. Don't eat the ovary wall of a nut. But you've got that, you know, those cotyledons inside, those oily cotyledons anise a uh, popular wintertime spice is the dried capsule of the anise tree or bush the star anise you can see this is a dry fruit and it splits open to release the seeds inside we've taken a lot of seeds and turned them into spices there's a separate hour on spices and so on so with that little holiday fruitcake farewell, it's time for us to launch a very quick poll. We're always looking to improve, expand, contract, um, improve, I already said, um, our presentation. So this is your opportunity to give us some feedback so that we can meet your needs where you are. I have a question in the Q&A from Alexa. Um, what is the peanuts oil for? So we talked early on about how the fruit contains the seeds and all, and those seeds are mostly made of food for the developing embryo before it gets to be big enough to make its own sugars. So the oil in a peanut is just a form it's a it's a form of nutrition for the developing embryo oils are very nutrient dense and long lasting and stable so while the seed might be waiting for the conditions to be just perfect for germination the the embryo which is very much alive will be consuming these oils. We've, and you know, plants are very good at making oils. We get lots of different oils from different plants and they're most often used to nourish and fortify the developing embryos. So thank you very much, very, very much for joining us today.
If you don't have any more questions, comments, or complaints, we'll go ahead and call it a day. And we have a few announcements for upcoming classes and webinars. Thank you again for joining us. If you do need to contact me with anything you'd like to say off the air, uh, our new email configuration, first initial last name, so it's jstevenson at pinellas.gov. Much easier than having to type out pinellascounty.org, pinellas.gov. List of upcoming webinars and classes. Next month, we're going to be featuring air plants. What does that mean? Um, we'll let you know. Uh, not how to grow them, but what they are. Remember, I'm not the Hort guy. Um, January 19th, Life of Lichen. That one's hosted by Whedon Island Preserve. Again, um, on January 21st, uh, this will be an in-person class at the East Lake Library, Wood Wide Web, How Fungus Unites Entire Ecosystems. Um, and on January 22nd, it's a Sunday, we don't know yet, but it's going to be something, and it's going to be at Brooker. So hope to see you next month, either virtually or right in person here at Brooker Creek or at East Lake Library. Failing that, I'm going to call it an afternoon. Thank you all for joining us and see you next month.